How many know God is faithful? Hallelujah. I believe God wants to challenge us a little bit today. I believe that over the last two or three or four weeks, five weeks, the word that's come forth has been very challenging. I don't know about you, but last week, after my brother got through speaking, I meditated on that word quite a bit. Some people don't understand really what took place last week. Some of you do. But as much as I asked Brother Cavazos to preach a word, instead he let God speak to us. Sometimes that word can be painful. But the truth is, truth is, each one of us in this room have a choice each week when we come into the house of God, or we listen to a sermon online, or we do anything where God's word is preached, we have a choice. We can either absorb it, apply it to our life, and walk in it, or we can reject it. Unfortunately, a lot of the world right now is rejecting the fact that they need to be in this house worshiping God with us. It's the truth. Some people say, well, where's so-and-so? Where's this person? Where's that person? And the funny thing is, I want to respond the way I'm fixing to respond now, and that is, I cannot give an account for what's going on in somebody else's heart, in somebody else's life. I can only give an account for me. But here's what I do know. The enemy has lied to this generation to make them think that they are okay in their mess. That they're okay at their homes on Sunday morning. That they're okay living and making the decisions that they're making. And when a preacher stands up and preaches truth, it offends them and they stop coming. Or they, I don't want to hear that. I want to, I want to be loved into the kingdom of heaven. God loves me, so he's going to treat me a certain way. How dare he challenge me in my sin? And the same people raising children wonder why when their children get to a certain age, they don't want nothing to do with the church. Well, what have you showed them their whole life? You've showed them that it's okay to lay out on Sunday, that you don't need church, you don't need God's people, you don't need the Lord except when something goes wrong. I felt that in my heart so strong lately. Because I look at heads. I've said this before, and I've preached a couple of sermons. I don't count nickels and noses. Never have. I come and say, God, you have your way. Who shows up? I trust. But I'm going to be very honest. Here lately, as people have dwindled and people have stopped coming, and some of the people, guys, were here faithful for a long time. I love dearly in my heart, and they're part of this body, and they're missing. I feel like spiritually we're hobbling around on one leg sometimes because they're not here doing what God's called them to do. And I'm praying for an awakening. I'm praying that not only we wake up as a church, and I believe God was speaking to us last week saying, wake up. I'm praying for those who are not here will wake up where they're at. And they will realize that their fellowship is needed, not just for us needing them, but they need us. I don't want to be challenged, Pastor Wayne. I'd rather you preach to me about love and grace and mercy and all that. You get all that. That's how you're here. By grace we've been saved, amen, through faith. <laughs> I didn't want it to get quiet. I preach much better when y'all amen it. <laughs> I'm being silly. But the truth is, when we start challenging ourselves, and I'm challenging me too, God wants more of us. And most of the time, we want to give him just enough to get by. Praise the Lord. I don't know how long I'm going to preach today. Long enough. How's that? Story of three friends, Shug, you'll like this, that went deer hunting together. A lawyer, a doctor, and a preacher. That's a pretty good combination, deer hunters. As they walked through the forest, they all three saw a big buck at the same time. They all three aimed their rifles, and they all three shot at the exact same time. And immediately the buck hit the ground. You ever done that, Burns? Buck just draw. Oh, you don't shoot deer. I keep forgetting. He miss. I pray against your deer. 
But immediately they all three ran up to the big buck and they started claiming that they shot the deer. But the truth is they really did not know who shot the deer. They all three shot at the same time. So this big debate broke out and it really turned into an argument and then the game warden walks up. Yeah, that's happened. The doctor was telling the game warden, said, look, three people fired at this deer. I know it was me that made the fatal, uh, fatal shot. The lawyer goes, no, it wasn't you. It was me. I'm the one that took the fatal shot. And the, the preacher was back there going, look, y'all say what y'all want to say, but I'm not going to lie to you. That's my deer. So the officer looked at the deer and immediately stood up with great confidence and he said, the preacher shot the buck. Of course, the lawyer and the doctor were like, that's, you don't know that by looking at that deer. And the game warden goes, absolutely, I know the uh, preacher shot that deer because it went in one ear and right out the other. <laughs> oh, amen. See, that happens a lot. Preachers get up on Sunday and they preach the word of God and we get a few amens. We get a lot of old me's sometimes. But then when you go out in life, you don't put into work or put into action what you just heard. So it's like you listen and it just shot right through and went out the other side and didn't grab in between. I'm praying that this church, the things start grabbing. And that when God challenges us to step forth and do what he's called us to do, we'll do it in boldness. But such as praying for the sick and believing. When I pray for Wendy... I have faith. I want the same exact faith that I have praying for y'all that I pray for her. Because sometimes praying for her, I have to struggle a little bit. Why? Because it's different. It shouldn't be. I want the book of Acts. I want the ministry of Jesus where he said, I will do these things and greater. And I will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. I want to see it, Lord. I don't want to just preach it. I don't want to just read the scripture. I want to function in that power. And I want every one of us to do that as well. And I also want to be so full of God that when I walk into an environment, I don't have to say anything about God. They just know God's there because he's in me. Brother, he dwells in my heart. And I want that to ooze over into the environment I'm in. Nothing feels greater than someone saying, man, what is it about you that's different? And I've said nothing. But the problem is, I don't get enough of that. And I want more of that. I want God to show up. And I read a book six years ago, probably, by Kyle Eidelman called, Are You a Fan or Are You a Follower? And I picked up that book this week. And I didn't think I was even going to talk about it today, but for some reason this morning it woke up on my brain. And that's all I could think about. And the truth is, everybody in this room, you're either a fan or you're a follower of Jesus. Because you're following something. We talk about the people who are not here right now, and my heart breaks for them. But they're following something. Come on. They are. They're following something. This morning, everybody in America is following something or someone. They're following friends. They're following family. They're following their own desires. They're following whatever's culturally or politically popular right now. Whatever, whatever the greatest, latest whim is, that's what people are following. But Jesus says, follow me. He doesn't say follow all the other things. He doesn't say follow churches. He doesn't say follow religion. He says follow me. Listen, this morning a fan jumps on the bandwagon when everything's going well. But a follower doesn't give up, even in the lean years. I wore this shirt today because it's entering college football season. I have forever been a football fan. And at one time, I played the game. But a lot of fans think they're experts because they're fans. But there's the truth is, out on that field, it's a different ball game. And inside this church, there's a lot of people who are fans of Jesus because of what he can do for them and what he has done and what he might do. But when God asks you to give something up and get in the game put some sweat into it, you're like, hold on a second, God, you're asking too much. 
You mean to tell me you really want me to do this? I had a brother tell me just this week, he said God was dealing with him about a circumstance in his life. And he, he finally, God broke him. He said, I will give up everything, God, on this earth to follow you. Nothing on this life owns me. No possessions, no stuff, nothing. The only thing that owns me is you, Jesus. This morning, understand that a fan is close enough to be associated with Jesus. Hey, I know you go to church on Sunday. You must be one of those Jesus people. But it's not close enough that when people say, can you help me? They step up to the plate and help. Instead, they stand off at the back and say, let somebody else do it. A fan in here this morning will confuse knowledge about God with intimacy with God. Just because you're here this morning and you know who Jesus is, and you know what he did, and you, you accept that, does not mean you have a relationship with him. You can even be full of scripture, memorize it in your head, and have tons of head knowledge, but no heart knowledge. And have no relationship with the God of the Word. And Lord knows you can know the Scripture and not want to do it and follow it. Something else a fan can do to Jesus. A fan in here this morning will see the sacrifice Christ made for the church. But can't find any place in his life for this, or he or she has sacrificed their life for God's people or his church. A fan will disappear when it becomes uncomfortable. When the preaching becomes uncomfortable. When we're asked to carry our own cross, we'll get out and say, that's just not for me. A fan in here would like to watch from the sidelines. A follower of Christ says, Jesus, how may I serve this body and I'm not talking about Pastor Wayne and I'm not talking about Lighthouse Church I'm talking about the body of Christ how can I serve your body Lord how can I be of benefit over the last 60 or 70 years we've seen a lot of things happen in our nation to try to take God as out of the central core of people's lives and it has worked If Christians do not stand up and take hold of what is theirs, and that is the basic fundamental truth that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, that too will be taken away. You say, well, Pastor Wayne, that can't be taken away. You watch. 1947, the first, it, the first time it was ever mentioned of separation of church and state, and look where it's at now. 1954, the Johnson Amendment came on where it tried to muzzle pastors from talking about anything that may be too religious or political. They want to stop it. God forbid if we were to get up here and say, this is it, this shouldn't, Christians shouldn't do this, and Christians shouldn't do that, and we shouldn't vote one way or another way because of what they support, because that becomes an issue with the government. And then, of course, we know about in 1962 when prayer was attacked, taken out of schools, and we wonder why our, church, our, our schools are in the shape they're in. Take God out of it. And now we move 60 years ahead and you're like, well, where's God? Well, you ran him out 60 years ago. What do you expect? And of course, we just had the, the deal with the Roe versus Wade being overturned. And we rejoice in that. But the truth is, watch the agenda. Realize that the Supreme Court did what they're supposed to do. But don't think for one second... Those evil leftist crazies are not trying to do something even worse. Pay attention. And then, of course, in 2015, the sanctity, the holiness of marriage was challenged. This is all things nobody wants to hear about. They want to come on Sunday morning and they want to feel the Holy Ghost goosebumps and get the good feeling throughout your body. And, oh, I had a good day at church. Man, it was great worship. Preacher didn't preach very long, and I got out of there before everybody else. But then come on a Sunday morning where the preacher says, it's time for us to be holy because God is holy. It's time for us to change our life and be who Christ called us to be. And next week, people will stay home. 
40 years ago, if I would have stood up in this pulpit and quoted Jeremiah 1 and 5 and said, Behold, I formed you in your wound, I knew you, before, in your wound before I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you and I ordained you as a prophet. And said that ripping babies out of the wound and wasted abortions was sin and murder. I could have got away with that. But today when I do that, they're liable to censor me and put up a notice on my, on my video saying that, that fact checkers have checked, checked and that a baby is really not a baby until it is. Church, a baby is a baby at conception. I don't care what the fact checker said. I love the post going around where it says the fact checkers, checkers argued with Noah until they all drowned. Thirty years ago, if I'd stood in this pulpit and I'd have read Romans 1, 26 through 32, and I said, For this reason God gave us up to God gave them up to vile passions, for even women exchanged their natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also men, leaving their natural use of women, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. And even they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. God gave them over to their debased mind to those things that they were not fitting and said homosexuality is wrong. People would have said, Pastor, where's your tolerance? Where's your love? I could have kept on in that scripture and said, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness, they are whisperers, backbiters, whisperers or gossipers, if you didn't know who that was. Backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventory of evil things, inventors of evil things, and disobedient to parents. Undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but are also approved of those who practice them. Somebody would have told me after church, Pastor Wayne, you're preaching too hard and you're meddling. When the truth is, that is the word of God. Our faith is in God and his son Jesus Christ and then we trust his word for everything in between. We want to stand up for the things that we like. You know what, God? I agree with that. Amen. That's good. I'm blessed. I'm prosperous. Oh, you want me not to sin? Wait a minute. Hold on, God. Really, just on Sundays, right? I'm only not supposed to sin on Sundays. It's the truth, guys. If I had to preach Matthew 19, starting in verse 4, have you not? Uh, and he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined? To his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. And preached and testified that marriage is between a man and a woman, period. No other way. I would be told that I'm intolerant of the way things are today. But I want to tell you this morning, I am not just a fan of Jesus. I am a follower of Jesus. And if his word tells me it's sin... It is sin. If we're going to do what God's called us to do, then we need to get ourselves right. Come on. We need to get filled up and walk in the holiness God has given us, the potential power through the Holy Spirit to walk in holiness so we can do what God's called us to do. Because what, what the world's looking for right now is for you and I to mess up so they can say, see, look, you're, real, you're a Christian and you do this. Come on. You're a Christian? Oh, yeah, sure you are. How many has ever heard they, oh, you're a Christian? Yeah, sure you are. Because they're trying to justify their life by our life. You want to justify your life? Justify it up against God. Who says, be holy, for I am holy. Come on. Sin separates us from God. Are you a fan of Jesus this morning? Do you love what he has to offer? Are you excited about what Jesus is doing? Are you a follower? And you're saying, Lord, put me in the game. 
I'm tired of just sitting on the front row or sitting on the bench going, man, that's cool, God, what you're doing. I want to be used. I want to benefit the kingdom. Jesus says in Luke chapter 9, says, he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when, it comes in his, when he comes in his glory, own glory, and in his fathers and in the holy and of the holy angels. The problem with so many people in this world is stuff has control of them. They, God is no longer their priority. He is their last resort. Come on. I hate to say that and I hate to even think that, but it's the truth. The reason people are falling out of church left and right, it's not because preachers aren't preaching their heart out. It's not because they're not praying. It's not because they're not fasting. Because the enemy wants to tell us that. You're just not doing enough. The truth is the enemy has lied to so many Christians and they think they're okay that they can just lay out and do it their own way. But there's a rude awakening coming, church. Are you going to be where God wants you to be when he, when he blows that trumpet? Are you going to be doing... I always say this and I mean this. If you think it's okay, you need to ask yourself this. If the trumpet sounds when you're doing what you're doing... I don't believe that's going to happen, Pastor Wayne. No, it may not. It may not be like that. I actually think the trumpet's going to sound on Sunday morning. You know why? Because we're going to be in church just like this. There'll be a few of you saying, oh, amen. There'll be a few and you say, oh, me. And there'll be a few and you say, hurry up, Pastor. I'm ready to go eat. But then the trumpet's going to sound. You know what's going to happen? Some of y'all are going to look around and go, where'd everybody go? Oh, come on, Pastor Wayne. You're meddling again. It's the truth. I think it's going to happen on Sunday morning because there's so many in church playing church trying to get out of God what they can get out of God and still in giving God everything that that trumpet's going to sound and it's going to wake them up. People say, what happens when God comes back and pulls his church out here? Man, it's going to go crazy, this and that. I agree, it's going to go crazy. But there's going to be people who have been on the fence who are going to go, oh no, I've done waited too long. And they're going to go crazy after God. Come on. Are you sold out for Jesus this morning? Are you begging our coach Jesus to put you in the game? Please use me, Lord. Please let me make a difference in somebody's life. Or are you standing back going, maybe Brother David will pray for him. Or maybe Lily will be a blessing to him. Come on. Maybe Barry will do it. Barry's going to do it. I don't have to do it. Barry's going to do it. Or even Mueller, man. Mueller's going to do it. Chris is going to do it. I don't have to do it. One of those guys, one of my brothers are going to pull the weight for me. Are you standing there going, Lord, give me the opportunity to make a difference in somebody's life. Quit thinking about what you're going to do and start doing it. Quit talking to yourself about, man, God may want me to, man, get in action. Start doing it. You got a friend, you got friends, or you got family that's lost, and you, God's been saying that you need to talk to them. Stop waiting for Pastor Wayne to pick up the phone and call your friends. Y'all do it. Put me in, coach. I'm not a fan. I'm, I want to follow you. I want to serve you. I want to be available for you. So what is Jesus saying when he says, take up your cross? You ever thought about that? In 2022, a lot of people think a cross is a strained relationship, a bad boss. No, Justin, I'm not talking about you. <laughs> I did this a long time ago before I knew 
or maybe even a physical illness. We get this self-pity pride that this cross is about something that's going wrong in our life. It's this cross I have to carry that makes this life difficult. But that's not what Jesus said when he said, take up your cross and follow me. You need to think about the cross Jesus was referring to when you think about that. You know that cross that he carried up on Golgotha? That cross that he carried, he had to drag because they had beaten him almost to death to the point where he couldn't even carry that cross, that somebody had to carry it for him. That cross that meant sure death, that's the cross he's talking about. Pastor Wayne, that's too, uh, that's too rough preaching. You need to stop. That's the cross Jesus was talking about. We think because something in our life doesn't go right or we've got some kind of problem in our life, we go, oh, poor, poor, pitiful me. That must be my cross. That's not what Jesus was talking about. He was talking about that cross that meant sure death that he was facing so that he could redeem mankind that he knew was going to be full of pain. And it was going to require for him to die. And it was going to be the most painful, the most humiliating, the most horrible thing you can possibly imagine. But today, when we think of the cross, we think of the little gold piece around our neck. People wear it as a trophy. It's time for us to stop wearing it as a trophy and get on it. Crucify this flesh. Say, God, use me. May I be different. So what he really meant when he said, take up your cross and follow me, means you trust him so much and you want to be so much like him that you're willing to die for your faith. I'm willing to do whatever it takes, Lord, to make a difference in this world. I'm willing to die to self. It's no longer about me. It's about you. Oh, I've got to deal with an ailment. Lord, you're going to get me through. Oh, I'm struggling in this area of my life. Lord, you're faithful. I'm not giving up. I've repeated myself so many times from this pulpit as things have come against us in our life. Those are not crosses. Those are just hindrances to what God has called us to do. We will not stop moving forward. We will not stop looking back. And we will not stop trusting God. I don't care what happens. I really don't. Pastor Wayne, what if? I don't care. God, if, you bring, if it brings you glory, then use us. Jesus drew crowds. Multitudes followed him when he was on earth. Did they follow him because they enjoyed his message? Or did they have, follow him because they had, he had what they wanted or needed? That hasn't really changed 2,000 years later. Most people come to church because of what Jesus can do for them. I said that nothing can happen to run you out of church if you're coming for Jesus. Well, the preaching's just not good enough. The worship just doesn't set me on fire. Well, I really wish we had this going on in this church or that going on in this church. I really wish that we would pick up this program or we would do this outreach. All of that won't matter if God calls you to this house to serve this body. You will come and you will say, put me in, Jesus, wherever you want me to serve, however you need me to serve, and I will do it. Well, I don't. Pastor Wayne doesn't pat me on the back enough to tell me how much he loves me and how good he thinks I am at what I do. Well, guess what? I love you, Burns. I appreciate you. But I'm still praying against your deer hunting. I love you, Suge. Mama Suge. Mama, Mama Suge. Nay, nay. We're laughing, but the truth is, every one of you guys, I can look you in the eye and say I love you, and I'm glad you're here, and I'm glad God calls you here. Come on. I'm glad that God called us to do that outreach last year when every preacher around me told me I was crazy. You know why? Because, Danny, you came that day, brother. You remember that day? I sure do. Brother Dwayne Grider was fixing this miss, and I come up and said, oh, wait a minute, we've got to have an altar call. And this brother got up and gave his life to Jesus, and God's been showing up ever since. Come on. Come on, Amen. That's what we need. 
Let me serve, God. Let me do whatever you need me to do. Well, Pastor Wayne hadn't asked me, God. I shouldn't have to ask. You should be begging for a place to serve God. When I was in high school and we played football, I didn't ask the coach if I could go in. I went out there and tapped the other guy and said, get off the field. I want to play. And me and, this, me and my, but my sub, my buddies they called it, we would have words. He would say, Wayne, you've only been out one play. I went, this is what I'm supposed to do. I can't do anything from over there. I don't want to stand there and pass out water. I want to be on the field. I want to be pushing the line forward so we can get a touchdown. Church, I don't want to stand back and watch y'all work. I want both feet in. I want to do what God's called me to do. I want to preach the gospel. Come on, I want to lay hands on the sick and see them recover. I don't want to stop. I want to keep moving forward. Well, what if I don't care? What if the government, I don't care. We need to keep pushing forward. Something else is coming to try to close down the church. Something else is fixing to happen to try to hinder what we're doing. We're not listening. I'm listening to God. We're moving forward. Come on. We're going to do things that people think are out of the ordinary or crazy because God said do it. I'm not asking for man's approval. Don't be lied to or misled by some of these people who are preaching. And I almost said preachers. They're not preachers because they're preaching lies. That tell you once you give your heart to Jesus, everything's going to run smoothly. That's not what the word says. It says through trials, through tribulations. Guys, in this life, there's going to be tribulation. Jesus said it. But be a good cheer. He's overcome this world of his life. You and I are going to have battles. Some days it's going to be difficult. Other days it's going to be worse. But praise be to God, it's only for a momentary moment. It's just for a moment. Everything here is just a vapor. I was going through some pictures that my mom brought me. But back when I was a little boy, yes, I used to be little, if you can believe that. But I was looking at some of those pictures. It was bringing about memories. And then I was kind of following along and seeing myself grow up. And then seeing how my kids started coming into the pictures. And I was like, Lord, where did these 52 years go? And I was reminded, our life is but a vapor. What are we doing with it? What are we, what are we doing with what God has given us right now? Are we really planning ahead? Are we storing up in heaven? Or are we just trying to get by right now? When we talk about picking up your cross, I want you to consider these questions. Are you willing to follow Jesus this morning, even if you lose some of your closest friends? Are you willing to follow Jesus this morning, if it means your family will alienate you? Are you willing to follow Jesus this morning, if it changes people's opinion of you, or your reputation of them, and they think you've lost your mind and gone crazy? Yes. I'm a Jesus freak. Yes, I'm crazy for Jesus. Yes, I look at things differently, and I do so proudly. And if that offends you, get in line. You're not the only one. Are you willing to follow Jesus, even if it affects your job? Are you willing to follow Jesus if it takes your life? Pastor Wayne, that's a pretty bold statement, if it takes your life, because in America... We're not really challenged by our life. You said it great while ago, Lily. We got it pretty good. It's kind of cushy, cushy. Missionaries every day lose their life for the kingdom. And we won't even tell our cousin or our aunt or our brother or our uncle or our friend about Jesus because they might be offended. So are you willing this morning? Are you willing to do whatever's necessary to make a difference on this side of glory? Are you really willing to pick up a cross and say, Jesus, I'll get on this cross if it means bringing somebody to you? Are you willing to face the challenges that are coming in these future days as the world moves further and further away from Christ? Commitment to Christ and to His cause means picking up your cross daily regardless of what your hopes, dreams, and possessions, and everything else in this life are, saying it's all for you, Jesus, and nothing else matters. The reward for us, although does come on this side of heaven, is promised in heaven.
We will reap what we sow on this side of heaven. We will be blessed on this side of heaven. We will prosper on this side of heaven. Come on, there are blessings on this side of heaven. But our goal is heaven. Our goal is taking as many people there as we can. Don't be so selfish with your life that you would say, what matters now is what's happening now. No, what matters is what's going to happen in the future. Heaven's our goal. You got a friend that's lost? Ask them, do you, do you realize following me will take you out of your comfort zone? Who in here is comfortable where they're at? They think everything's hunky-dory in their life, their job, everything. There's, that's a word for that. It's called contentment. When you become content, that can be very dangerous. Oh, man, I got it going good, man. God's blessing me. Everything's going good, man. Are you willing to give up those comforts for the kingdom today? Are you, reali- are you willing to realize that the true follow- follower of Christ can be very difficult? Have you really counted the cost? Have you said, Jesus, no matter what happens, I'm willing to do whatever it takes? Some of you this morning are fearful of following Christ fully for what he might ask you to do. You know it's true. Some of you sitting here right now are going, man, if I really give it all to God, he might ask me to do something crazy. You're right. He might ask you to trust him. He might ask you to serve him. He might ask you to tell somebody about him. Pastor Wayne, that's really not crazy. It is for some. You don't trust him with every area of your life. You trust him with the areas that you can really control. I trust you, Lord, but if you don't do it, I can. Man, Lord, I pray for my friend. They need you, Lord. They are lost, and they're going to hell, Lord, without you. I need you, Lord, to intervene. My son, my daughter, Lord, my cousin, my aunt, my uncle, Lord, intervene. Then you hear that voice. Jesus says, have you told them about me yet? I hear your prayer, and you're right. They need me. Stop being a fan. Get in the game. So instead of saying, Lord, speak to me. Speak to my family members. Speak to my friend. Saying, Lord, give me the opportunity and the words to say and let me go and do it. And then stop waiting for the opportunity. Go do it. It's the truth. Get up and go do it. Well, you don't understand. My friend thinks this about the church. And you can give me all the excuse in the world. And I'll go, yep, I've not heard them. I've heard them all. You're right. Your friend probably thinks the church is a bunch of kooky people. I'm a holy roller. Yes, I'm a holy roller. You watching online? I will flip over pews and jump up and down and run around this place. Praising God. And I don't normally do it in church because I freak y'all out. But I'm crazy about Jesus. And I don't care if everything in this world goes by the wayside. Possessions don't have me. Jesus has me. He's alive in me. May the things of this world be dead in me so that I may live for Christ. I'm going to finish with this scripture this morning. Because I know the scriptures, I know the things that I've read, the things that I've said. Some of the things are challenging. But when we come to church and God challenges us, you remember earlier I said you really have one of a couple of choices. You either can absorb it and say, man, that was for me. I want to be different. Or you can, or you can even use this thing. I've heard this, said. I walked up on somebody talking one time. Pastor Wayne was on one today. Yeah, I was. He was preaching awful hard. and Why didn't he just tell me Jesus loves me? He does. He loves you so much. Don't you remember? That's how much he loves you. Nails, nails, nails. 39 scour- scourges because he couldn't take the 40th because it would have probably killed him, which I don't know how he survived 39 because many of the people died before they got that many. 
He loves you more than you can imagine. But He wants you in the game. He wants you to stop standing back saying, well, somebody else will do what He's called you to do. I want you to understand, every one of you under the sound of my voice this morning, even the ones listening online, God has given you the ability to make a difference in somebody's life. That ability is only for you. They won't listen to me. Someday they will, but right now they're waiting on you. They're waiting on you to come and tell them what they need to hear to get them in here so that we can serve God together. They're waiting on you. And you're waiting on Jesus to put somebody else in the game. John 6, 66 and 67 says that from that time on, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, do you also want to go away? So why are you ending with that scripture this morning? Because the truth is this, when God challenges us, we have one of two choices. Do we want to go after God or are we going to turn back and just do it our own way? Well, I'm not going to go to church there. They preach too hard. I'm not going to go do that because, man, Pastor Wayne expects me to be holy. He expects me to follow the word. Goodness gracious, Pastor Wayne expects me to serve in the church. I cannot believe he really wants. I expect to come in the air conditioner, sit on this padded pew, and just have a good time and say amen and go home. How dare he ask me to pray for somebody? Some of y'all are smiling. Some of you are not because you know it's true. It's the truth. If I get you out of your comfort zone, you will stay away for fear that I may ask you to do something that you don't feel comfortable doing. Instead of saying, Jesus, put me in. Let me make the difference in somebody's life. Why do I call these people forward today? Why did I ask people to come pray for them today? Why did I do that? Because I want us all to exercise our faith together. I want us all to be able to stand up and say, God did what I asked him to do. No, not just Pastor Wayne. Pastor Wayne prayed for him, and man, God did. No, we, the body of Christ, joined together and said, Coach, you said if I would anoint them with oil and pray the prayer of faith and believe and not doubt, you would heal the sick. I did that, now I'm standing on that, and I'm believing that. Praise God. I will say this morning, Jesus, if nobody else says it, and I know that I'm not the only one, put me in, Jesus, let me play. I don't want to ride the bench. Church, I've never been a bench rider. I, when I started playing football in high school, I wanted to play. I remember playing my first varsity football game. The coach said, you know you're a sophomore, and we don't usually let sophomores play on first team. I said, coach, I'm starting or I'm going back to JV. He said, do what? I said, you heard me. I did not sign up for football to stand on the sidelines. Church, I did not give my life to Jesus, and I don't trust him with every area of my life to stand on the sidelines and say, I hope you do what I need to be doing. Some of y'all need to stand up and say, put me in, coach. I got this. Dakota, got that song for me, brother? We're going to play a song. I was coming to church this morning. Actually, I was going to ask Barry to play a song, and then the Holy Spirit said, I'm going to give you a song. I'm like, I'm not singing. <laughs> Y'all say, praise God. <laughs> not yet. I want you to be ready, but I ain't ready just yet. You ready? He's ready. But I got in the car. Turn the radio on. This is the second song that came on. And as soon as it came on, I just didn't hear it with my ears. I heard it with my spirit. And I started feeling it. And I told Wendy exactly what happened. I said, sweetheart, it's the craziest thing. And I kind of briefly told her in a, a minute or two what I was kind of going to preach on. And I said, I asked God for a song because I wanted a chance for people to respond. Because the truth is, right now, it's 12.08. Why did I tell you that? Because I know some of you have already looked. It's 12.08. Pastor Wayne's still talking. But I want you to take up the cross. Some of you have a cross you need to take up and say, Pastor Wayne, I haven't been doing what God asked me to do. God spoke to us pretty powerfully last week. It wasn't 
a sermon as much as it was a prophetic word and a challenge. Some of you got it. Some of you missed it. Today, God is speaking to us. And He's challenging you to be different. So you have to make a choice. Do you want to be different? Are you satisfied with the contentment that's in your life? I can't change that. Only you can and only God can. 